Take your Bibles, if you would, please, and open to the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter number 11. Brother Starr will uh, complete his lessons uh, when he is back in town. So uh, I'm going to uh, mention something that is a little bit in between some of the things that are going on. You've oftentimes heard uh, of the two witnesses that are going to be preaching during that three and a half years. And, uh, and so we're going, to look at, uh, we're going to look at them tonight just a little bit. But let's begin in Revelation chapter number 11, beginning in verse number 1. Uh, let's, we'll basically start off going through here, and we'll get as far as we can this evening. Beginning in verse number 1, the Bible says, And there was given me a reed like unto a rod. And the angel stood saying, Rise, and measure the temple of God in the altar, and them that worship therein. So in this instance, uh, all right, you help me out here just for a second. Who is, uh, who is the one that is receiving this revelation at the time? John. John is uh, exiled on an isle. What is the, uh, it, anybody recall the name of the isle? It is, it is Patmos. And uh, as he is there, uh, now understand something. A lot of times folks say, uh, this is a revealing of the end times. The truth is, it is a revealing of Christ is what it is. Because everything that is going to be circumferenced here is solely because of what his will is. Now, I, I think it's interesting because sometimes, now we understand very clearly that when the, the next thing, for the most part on God's calendar, is going to be that trumpet sound, the rapture will take place. Although the word rapture is not found in scripture, it means a catching away, a, a calling out, if you would. The Bible reminds us that uh, this same Jesus that left shall return in like manner. He's going to come in the clouds. There will be a trumpet sound, as scripture says, in the twinkling of an eye, those that have put their faith and trust in Christ uh, will be called out. Now, it is imminent. That means it's going to happen. Nothing can prevent it. Nothing necessarily can, can speed it up. Although I've heard some uh, that have uh, taught a lesson that... Uh, uh, God has a particular number that is set. And at the point that person gets saved, uh, he'll lean over to whoever's going to be sounding the trumpet and say, it's time. And uh, I don't know if that's necessarily true. There are verses that may lend that direction. Uh, but it is in the Father's will to know, and he is the only one that knows. So that means that uh, all of the, all the folks that want to try to find out through numerology uh, when, the, uh, when the Lord's going to come back... <laughs> Uh, I think that's a, a trifling, if you, if you will. It, it may be fun to speculate. And uh, I think, uh, now, I, I think, now, there's no definition to it, but God oftentimes does big events during some of the feast times and right around that. And, uh, and I kind of lean the direction that he will probably choose some of the feast days uh, in that manner when he re will return. Now, I don't know that for a fact. I just kind of lean that direction that it will happen somewhere around there. So as uh, Rosh Hashanah gets close, uh, I get a little bit excited. As uh, the Passover gets close, I get a little bit excited. And uh, as uh, the Day of Atonement and different things, I, I, I get excited because it's like, you know, now every day for me is even so come quickly, Lord Jesus. And uh, it, it will not disappoint me if he shows up at any time. And he can and so uh, in that manner, that reminds you and I to be prepared and ready. And uh, because everything that you have, the second you're gone, now you'll come back in about seven years, but it's all going to be for somebody to pilfer through. And so uh, uh, I'll put it like this. This world's not our home. We're just passing through. All those things, it's just like the uh, uh, recent days, uh, the, uh, the, the economy and the market is really uh, taking a, not, a dive right now. And uh, that means that investments that maybe we have had and things of that nature are taking a major hit. And, uh, and you may lose thousands and thousands and tens of thousands of dollars. But guess what? Once I'm gone, I don't care. I really don't. Now, I want to try to prepare for those that I'm supposed to be responsible for, and that's what I'm trying to do. But if the trumpet sounds, God's going to take care of all the rest of it. And so uh, in that manner, uh, yes, I'll try to be diligent. I'll try to make sure to prepare because the Lord could tarry another 1,000, 2,000 years. He can do that, and he requires me to be diligent and make sure to take care of the things that he has given me a responsibility for. So I'm trying to do that. 
but if he comes tonight, it'll be okay with me. And uh, I, I, <laughs> I, you get tired of smelling diesel fumes after a while anyway, so, uh, but uh, in that manner, it'll be okay. But he reminds us here that he is going to come. And because he is going to come, that means that you and I must be planning, preparing. Now, some of the things that he gives us here is still yet to come. John has seen them a few thousand years ago. You and I have not experienced them, seen them, but they are going to take place and they will happen just as scripture says they will. So the very first thing that John is, he is here, exile on the Isle of Patmos. And as uh, the revealing of the Lord Jesus Christ and the things that are going on begins to uh, un uh, unfold, if you would, he is, he is given now this measuring implement, this reed, if you would, that is going to be measured. And notice the three things that are going to be measured at this time. He says the temple is going to be measured. So in other words, God's focus in is on that, uh, that temple where... Uh, now, there is oftentimes some speculation as far as is he talking about a physical being or is he talking about the temple that you and I house, the Holy Spirit, today? So in that manner, uh, that could very well be. Understand something. Even as I was speaking to uh, uh, the rabbi just the other day, uh, and I, I, I wanted to try to pull him a little bit because Scripture to you and I is very, very sacred. And uh, it's God-inspired, so that means God breathed it and what, it, what he says, he means. It's not just a story. There's a literal things to it. And uh, now there are plenty of uh, uh, stories and instances in Scripture. But I, I wanted to try to narrow the focus down just a little bit. So I went over to Deuteronomy chapter number 8 that says, Man shall not live by bread alone, but, uh, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Now that comes mostly from Matthew, but it's referring back to Deuteronomy. And so uh, uh, I asked him, I said, does this mean that Jehovah will have to give us his word definitively and he has got to do that through the generations? He says, well, we kind of look at that verse a little differently. And I said, and so I'm asking him and he says, well, we kind of look at it like uh, man's not supposed to live by just bread alone. So enjoy things that are around you. I said, well, that's a, that may be one way to look at it. I said, but I'm asking, does God have a requirement to give you and I his word if he's going to require us to live by it? He says, that's a good question. <laughs> and so, uh, because there's been many times that he has said, well, uh, the, you know, the scripture is kind of fluid. It, it, it doesn't necessarily mean this and it's not. I want to try to focus him down as far as, is this really God's word? Or is it just stories that somebody has written down? Is it honestly given to us by God? Is it inspired as the New Testament says? Or is it just a good thoughts that somebody had pinned down? And uh, because you and I must understand that if, if it's holy writ, if God wrote it down, then that's exactly what you and I are supposed to believe, practice, and abide by. And so uh, uh, in this manner, he is reminding us here, I keep an eye on the things that, uh, that I deal with. He deals with the temple. Now, your temple and my temple is our body. And, uh, and he keeps an eye on that. And so it says here, measure the temple of God. Now, for you and I, we understand very, very clearly that the temple of God literally is our body because the Holy Spirit tabernacles inside of us. And so uh, in that manner, he is uh, told to do that. Now, my inclination is this because these are take, this is taking place after the rapture. So I think probably he is referring to a physical property right now a little bit more than the, uh, than the mortal beings that uh, you and I are. So I'm leaning that direction. So measure the temple of God and the altar. And so that place where sacrifices are going to be made. And then he says, and them that worship therein. Understand something. During the time after the rapture, there is still going to be a lot of, if I can use the term, worship going on. Because even those that do not believe that Jesus is the Messiah and they've put their faith and trust in him may still be religious in that manner and looking for something. Now, they may clearly know that something is happening, something's going on, but, uh, but they are still going to be worshipers of God. Now, understand this. Jesus said, I am not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That's even those that are in the tribulation period also. So in that manner, he wants to see as many people saved as he possibly can, even during this time where he's trying to get people's attention. And I think he's doing a pretty good job of it. And uh, it, certainly people are going to recognize this is not normal. This is not what we know. This is different. 
And so uh, uh, hopefully there is going to be those that will turn to, uh, turn to Christ at the time. Now, since he is measuring things, we must understand this. The fact that God sets the standard and everything will be measured by his grid. You and I don't set the standard. The government doesn't set the standard. As much as we hold our constitution as something that we must honor, God is still higher than all of those things. And so that means his standard is going to be set. It doesn't matter whether they pass legislation about something. It still is according to what God says, not what man says. And so God is the one that is doing the measuring here. It may be that they talk about political issues. It may be social issues. It may be certain things that may at one point have been anathema, but now they're accepted. But God says, I do not accept them. For instance, one thing that's going to be big uh, right now is, uh, and you hear it talked about oftentimes in the political scene as far as abortion is concerned. And there are certain states, and of course, recently, as the Supreme Court has basically taken away that federal issue uh, of things and given uh, a lot of the states now the jurisdiction as far as to determine what they're going to do about uh, legislating these things, there are some states that believe that a child, even after they are born, can still be murdered uh, if they don't want it. And uh, I, I think it's tragic, I think it's harmful, and I think God is opposed to that entirely. Because he reminds us, God hates those that shed innocent blood. And so uh, in that manner, uh, you and I must be diligent about following God's principles and precepts. God's measuring now. Not according to what man says, but according to what he says. So as he is giving John this measuring stick, he says, you're going to measure things according to my grid, not yours. And so he begins to measure those things. And in verse number two, he goes on to say, but the court which is without the temple, leave out and measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles. So uh, they're going to get a little bit of pass here on this instance. And so he's holding his people. Understand something. The focus in on the book of Revelation has to deal a great deal with that little plot of ground that is being fussed over right now, the Temple Mount and Israel in that area right there. And uh, so keep those things in mind in that general Middle East area. There are going to be angels that come out of the Euphrates. And there's going to be things that take place in that general area. And so God's focus is on that. We looked at before and how God is getting people to that area. Now, as we go on just a little bit further, he is reminding them here that uh, the things that are going to take place, verse number two, but the court which is without the temple leave out and measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles and the holy city uh, shall they tread underfoot 40 and two months. All right. Has anybody added up 42 months to come out with how long that is yet? Three and a half years. And uh, so the first three and a half years, there's going to be some measuring that takes place. And uh, of course, as you and I know, Israel has made a, a covenant with the Antichrist at the time. And, uh, and that's some of the things that are, are maybe still to be discussed just a little bit. But for three and a half years, this tribulation period is going to take place. The very next thing that we see here is this, and I will give power unto my two witnesses. So here's the two witnesses that basically are going to be prophesying and preaching now in the streets of Jerusalem and in that area. Now, uh, is it certainly going to be just two men individually? There has been the idea that they're talking about uh, two uh, thought processes and things of that nature. I'm not so certain that is uh, a good thing to, uh, because God says, I'm going to give two witnesses. And it appears to be two individuals. Could it be two larger groups of people? I guess it could be. Uh, but in that instance, whatever the case is going to be, there are two witnesses that are, that are now introduced. And at this point, as I said, God is still willing to save the lost. He came to seek and to save that which was lost. And so he is still interested in that even after the rapture takes place. So in that manner, he says, I will give power unto my two witnesses. And they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and threescore days clothed in sackcloth. Now sackcloth, of course, is because of mourning and the judgment that is to come. That, that, the re references to these speak easily in Job chapter 16, Esther 4, Genesis 37, and, and 2 Samuel chapter number 3. All of these uh, talk about how sackcloth is an Im important process of showing judgment and uh, mourning during this time. So they're going to be clothed, and it's going to be clearly that they're saddened by what has taken place. The measuring has taken place, and the measuring has come up off. So now it's time to get things justified and right. And so in that manner, they begin to try to prophesy 
to get things right. Prophesy about the truth. You know, it, it was a little bit sad because I had to make most of my references the other day to the Old Testament. And, uh, and I so badly wanted to ask him a little bit about the New Testament, but under, understand something. Jewish people don't hold the New Testament of any great value. Now, they do understand that it's there, and they have, uh, a number of them have read it. A lot of the rabbinical uh, uh, that rabbis have, even during their, their teaching, they've read a great deal of it. As much as I wanted to ask him about it, I didn't. I, I, I'm, I'm still on that ground of learning what I can ask and what I shouldn't ask. Uh, and so uh, in that manner, I didn't bring any of those things up. But in this, there's oftentimes the Jewish people, they are still God's people. They are still ones that will be worshiping God, Jehovah. They are still ones that have not accepted Jesus as their savior. And yet they still need to hear the message and God is still interested in getting the message to them. So, so these two witnesses are going to be prophesying. They are going to be preaching. They are going to be telling the truth. Now, notice when we come to verse number four, because it is kind of interesting. Now, so the question comes, these two witnesses, who are they? Could it be actually two individuals? It could be. Uh, we know that on the Mount of Transfiguration, that there was two individuals that came and spoke with the Lord at that time. Some of the instances that are here uh, push a little bit towards uh, who it could be. And so uh, we'll look at that here just a little bit. But it says that here in verse number four, these are the two olive trees. Now, this refers to the fact that they are probably going to have some Jewish heritage to them. That is oftentimes the leaning instance where it's talking about an olive branch. Even in the, the New Testament that says that you and I are grafted in, it says that we're grafted into that olive branch. And so uh, the Jewish people was the initial olive tree that was there. And so this olive branch that is being talked about in this olive, olive tree leans towards Jewish heritage. We'll see something else here in just a little bit why uh, it kind of leans that direction. So these two witnesses are probably going to have some Jewish heritage to them. It goes on to say, and the two candlesticks. Now, in that instance, we've already learned a little bit uh, early on about candlesticks because just a page or two back, if you would please, uh, go ahead and turn back to Revelation chapter number one. And look at verse number 20, if you would please. Because that, that element of a candlestick has been mentioned already. Verse number 20 says this, The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand, and the seven golden candlesticks, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven candlesticks which thou sayest, uh, sawest excuse me, are the seven churches. So could it be that in Revelation chapter number 11, when he's talking about these two witnesses, where he says, these are the two influential individuals that now have, if you would, are bringing this message. And this candlestick is the authentication that I have perpetuated on them. Uh, a church basically is only a church is if, it is, if God recognizes it as such. Just because there's a, a building, just because there's people meeting, does not make it a church. Uh, what makes it a church is when they determine to follow the precepts that God has given that would set the standard for being my church. Because he said, even in Matthew chapter number eight, uh, 16, verse number 18, where it says, upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So God is reminding us that that candlestick, that, that franchise, if you want to put it like that, is according to him, not according to anything else. Because people can meet, people can talk about God, but he may not be there. And uh, that is revealed very clearly in, uh, in chapters you know, 2, 3, and 4. And so in that uh, instance, we get here that God has ordained what they're doing. He is involved with what they're doing, with the message, the procedure, the process. So these two men, uh, let's look at some of them as we go on. The Bible says, and if any man will hurt them, now believe me, has there always been an aggression against one Jewish people? Yes. Has, and matter of fact, I asked, uh, I asked the rabbi the other day, I said, why is there an aggression against Jewish people? He said, that's been an age old question. So we went back to, uh, of course, Abraham and, and uh, the things that, that go on there. And, uh, but in that instance, there comes the occasion now where it says, will anyone hurt them? It, has anyone ever been against the gospel message? <laughs> Always. So they, they have two things against them. One, their heritage, and one, the message that they're speaking. So there is going to be people against them. 
So in that manner, uh, God says, I am going to protect them, and this is how I'm going to do it. I'm going to allow them to have an offensive manner, not just defensive, but offensive uh, to keep them protected. Notice it says, fire proceedeth out of their mouth. So in that instance, that means that there's going to be some manner where uh, fire is going to be expelled in some distance. Now, there has been occasions in the Old Testament. Keep your, uh, keep your finger right there on Revelation chapter number 11. And turn back, if you would please, to 2 Kings chapter number 1. 2 Kings chapter number 1. Second Kings chapter number 1. We have an event where Ahaziah is uh, basically uh, run into somebody. And uh, Elijah is uh, now uh, introduced somewhat, just a little bit. And I want you to notice as they're not happy with what's going on, uh, that uh, he is able to call down fire from heaven, if you want to call it in that manner. And uh, so notice if you would please, uh, let me back up just a little bit so we can get a little bit of context. Verse number five says this, and when the messengers turned back unto him, he said unto them, why are ye now turned back? And they said unto him, there came a man up to meet us and said unto us, go turn again unto the king that sent you and say unto him, thus saith the Lord, it is, uh, it is not because there is not a God in Israel that thou sendest to inquire of Beelzebub, the God of Ekron. Therefore thou shalt not come down from that bed. Uh, now, if you want to read what's going on before that, of course, uh, Ahaziah is, uh, is rebelling against God and uh, those things. And so he is trying to get answers for something. So he sends messengers to the false god, uh, Beelzebub, uh, the god that is there in Ekron and the, 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 the temple, the priests and things to try to go get an answer. Elijah shows up and says, <laughs> You're going to ask a false God, and it's not because there is not a God in heaven. There's not a God of Israel. It's because you don't want his answer. But he gives him the, he gives him the answer anyway. And uh, look at verse number seven. And he said unto them, what manner of man was he which came up to meet you and told you these words? Now he told him that you're not going to live. You're going to die. And so they turned back quickly because it's like, what are you doing back so soon? There's no way you could have gotten all the way to Akron. He said, no, we met a man on the way. And he told us, you're going to die. He said, and so he asked him, what kind of man was he? Verse number eight. And they answered him, he is a hairy man, girt with the, and so you fellas, don't worry about all the back hair. It'll be all right. It's a godly aspect, I guess. And so, uh, but uh, verse number eight, and they answered him, he is a hairy man and girt with a girdle of leather about its loins. And he said, it is Elijah, the Tishbite. He already knew who he was. That's why he didn't send them to him because he knew he wasn't a righteous man and Elijah would tell him the truth. And so notice, then the king sent unto him a captain of 50 with his 50 and he went up to him and, and behold, he sat on the top of a hill and he spake unto him, thou man of God, the king hath said, come down. Eh, I don't think he was all that interested. As I said, the measuring stick is according to God, not according to man. They stood up and they said, man of God, the king said, well, let's see what God has to say. Verse number 10, and Elijah answered and said to the captain of 50, if I be a man of God, then let fire come down from heaven and consume thee and thy 50. And there came down fire from heaven and consumed him and his 50. And also he sent an, uh, again him another uh, captain of 50 with his 50. And he answered and said unto him, O man of God, at least he recognized that, uh, thus hath the king said, come down quickly. And Elijah answered and said unto him, and said unto them, if I be a man of God, let fire come down from heaven and consume thee and, and thy 50. And the fire of God came down from heaven and consumed him and his 50. And he sent a, uh, a captain of a uh, third 50 with his 50. And the third captain of 50 went up and came and fell on his knees before Elijah. Oh, he wised up, didn't he? Fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. He said, I'm not dumb and like those guys. And he came and fell down before Elijah and he began to uh, make requests. And he said to him, O man of God, I pray thee, let my life and the life of these uh, 50, thy servants, be precious in thy sight. Notice he recognized how to deal with these. So there is an element in the, uh, uh, back to Revelation chapter number 11, 
that the individuals that is there could possibly be. Now, did Elijah, or did Elijah die that you and I know of? Not exactly. He was translated. He was taken up. And so because of that, the chariot of fire came and picked him up and took him off. Did God have a plan for him in the future? It could very well be. Uh, because it appears as though he is going to have some of the same aspects that he's had before. <laughs> Elijah could say, eh, I've done this before. I know what this work, how this works. And so it could be that that's part of that. We see here, fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devoureth uh, their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. So uh, understand that third captain understood very clearly. I'm not going to try to kill you. I'm not. Matter of fact, I'm going to find out if I can be precious in your sight. And so it, uh, there's, some, uh, there's some references that seem that could be the case. Uh, also in uh, 1 Kings chapter number 17 and verse number 1, it kind of leans that direction also. Verse number 6 in Revelation chapter number 11 says this. These have power to shut heaven, that it rain not in the days of their prophecy. Uh, now, you remember, there was a time when Elisha prayed, and it did not rain for three years. And so uh, in that manner, there was an instance where uh, these prophets are, are, have been mentioned because of that. And it goes on to say in verse number 6. These have power to shed heaven, that it rain not in the days of their prophecy, and have power over waters to turn them to blood, and to smite the earth with all plagues, as often as they will. Now, in Exodus chapter number 7, we see that the same plagues that Moses could pronounce upon uh, the, the people there in Egypt have a little bit of some of the same references that are here, turning water to blood and different things and plagues along those lines. And it says, as often as they will. And so uh, Deuteronomy chapter number 28 also explains uh, some of the things that are going on there. But they were given this power by God, and they recognized that. So anyone that would come to hurt them literally is coming against God. Now these two witnesses are there to prophesy, to tell the truth, to get that measuring stick so that everything is now justified and right and straight and right, and uh, to give the truth of what's going on. So their message is to measure things up. And uh, oftentimes to get them squared away, that's going to be the message that is going on because God is still interested in them and interested in the people that are here. Now, will people die? Yes, they will. Will people reject? Yes, they will. But it's not because they have not get, been given a chance over and over again. Uh, let, me, let me go down just a little bit quickly because I would really like to take some time to talk about the two olive branches from Zechariah, and I may at some point or another. But uh, in, in this instance, as we move down just a little bit further, verse number seven says this. And when they shall have finished their testimony, uh, the beast that ascended out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. So the beast is going to have authority. It's going to have power. And, and uh, in that manner, we'll have the ability to be able to kill them. Now see here as it goes on. And they're excuse me, verse number eight, and their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, uh, where also our Lord was crucified. So we know very clearly that it's there in Jerusalem. So in that manner, that is where they're preaching and they lie there in the streets. So it goes on to say this, and they of the people and kindred of, uh, and tongue and nations shall see their dead bodies three days and a half. So everyone's gonna be able to see it. The cameras will be on it. The world will be able to see it no matter where anyone is. And I think a great deal of the world is going to be right there in that area. Uh, but they will be able to see what's going on and see those things. Now, I want you to notice, now they're going to defile their body, which is a, an opposition to Jewish law. And so it says here that they're going to leave them lay in the streets for three and a half days. So it, it, for Jewish culture is this. Once somebody dies, they are to be buried immediately. That even goes on today. And so uh, we, we know they're trying to show how much power they have by leaving them in the streets. We defile who you are and uh, we, do, we don't accept it. So they're going to leave them there in defiance to what Jewish law should be. So as it goes on just a little bit further here, uh, it says, and they of the people of kindred uh, and tongue and nation shall see their dead bodies three days and a half and shall not suffer their bodies to be put in graves. So it leans again towards the fact that they have a Jewish heritage and they're doing this with intent and purpose. One, so that everybody could see. Two, to say we have power over what God had sent uh, to testify and things of that nature. And, uh, and we're also going to defile the fact that they're Jews and we're leaving them in the streets. 
And so uh, just over and over again, they're trying to poke, uh, Satan's trying to uh, poke in the eye of God. <laughs> but that's not the end of the story. We'll have to take up from there in just a little bit. And so uh, uh, but we're out of time tonight. Let's all stand.